Hey, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for joining Beth Jacob for this important conversation. Together with two distinguished physicians, Dr. Rachel Zabner Spielberger and Dr. Sam Torbati, we find ourselves at a critical juncture of this pandemic. A confluence of unusual circumstances has generated for us really a mixture of emotions and responses. We find ourselves firstly in a very, very dangerous time in which we're experiencing an alarming surge in the number of individuals who are infected by COVID-19. Hospitals are overwhelmed with a lack of beds and resources. One nurse told me personally that she never imagined that the situation in the hospital could get so bad. And so at the same time, while the pandemic has wrecked havoc around the world and caused devastating losses, and now it seems worse than ever at the same time, the development of new vaccines give us much cause for hope that we finally have a path out of this crisis. From community members, including some of you, to doctors, some of whom are on the call here, that I'm speaking to, people are excited about the vaccines. And the vaccine is already being given to the first tier of people such as frontline healthcare workers and nursing home residents. So at this critical juncture, at this time of great danger and also great promise, it's our responsibility to become educated about the vaccine so we can receive accurate information and act accordingly. And being that this is all so new and it's happened so fast, it is understandable that many have questions, which is why we organized this program tonight. And the questions or issues that we'll discuss include the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, the science of how it works, the lifespan of the protective antibodies that it produces, and beyond the vaccine itself, thinking about distribution, are we prepared to conduct, as a country, to conduct the largest and most complex public health campaign of the modern era? What are, new, what are the new strains of the virus appearing in the UK mean for the vaccine? And as, as, observant, as observant Jews, we're guided by the Torah and by halacha. So what does halacha say about the vaccines? And what are the Jewish perspectives, if any, and there always is, there always are some Jewish perspectives on vaccination. And so with these important questions, we're blessed to have the opportunity tonight to have this conversation with Dr. Torbati and Dr. Zabner Spielberger. Dr. Sam Torbati is medical director and co-chairman of the emergency department at Cedar sinai He is literally on the front lines of the battle and one of the most highly respected clinical leaders in LA County. Reflecting this, Dr. Dabadi was featured in the Los Angeles Magazine as one of the top doctors selected by their peers and was also recently invited by Sharit Tzedek Hospital to present the findings of his COVID-19 research. Dr. Rachel Zabner, excuse me, Dr. Rachel Zabner Spielberger is an infectious disease specialist affiliated with Cedar sinai Medical Center with fluency in English and Spanish, Dr. Zabner was featured recently on Telemundo, Univision, and CNN to share her expert knowledge about COVID. Many months ago, based on the recommendations of a couple of physicians in our shul, we turned to Dr. Zabner, a Beth Jacob member herself, and asked if she would serve as a lead medical advisor for our community, which she thankfully agreed to do. And so our shul is deeply grateful to you, Dr. Zabner, for your time and expertise, which have been really instrumental in helping us navigate this crisis uh, safely. So tonight we have the privilege to hear from two highly respected physicians with years of experience and specific expert knowledge about the COVID-19 virus and the vaccines, which of course is the topic tonight. We thank them so much for joining us. So here's how the program will work. Uh, Dr. Sam Torbati will make a presentation about the vaccine and related issues, addressing some of the questions that I've raised. I will follow with a review of a number of halachic perspectives. And then that'll be followed by a question and answer session with Dr. Zabner and Dr. Torbati with the questions and answers being a significant portion of the program. If you have any questions, I'd like to ask you to please send it to me via the chat function. 
And this way, when we have time to, for the questions and answers, we'll hopefully be able to get to your uh, question that you submit. Okay, so thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Torbati and Dr. Zabner for being here and for sharing your time and expertise with us. And it's my pleasure now to hand it over to Dr. Sam Torbati. Dr. Tarbati, it's um, you're on. All righty, I am going to just upload a presentation. Please let me know if you can see the slide. Can you see the slide? Yes, we could see it. Wonderful. So uh, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for this invitation to join you tonight to talk about this very important topic. Um, indeed, it's the number one topic uh, of all topics that we've, we've dealt with in our entire generation. Um, I prepared a perhaps a 10 minute presentation on um, some general topics where we are with this, uh, with this pandemic, with some of the treatments and such, and hopefully it'll serve as a, a backdrop to some uh, QA uh, question answers that will come up. So um, with that said, um, these are some of the sobering statistics that we hear about on the news every day. As of today, this is the latest statistics. Um, we have uh, over 80 million global cases, over 19 million in um, the United States. Um, boy, that's, that's a lot of lives. Um, a lot of lives lost, some uh, 1.7 million cases globally. Um, in uh, California, we've had over 2 million cases and 24,000 deaths. In Los Angeles County, some 700,000 cases of COVID-19 with uh, nearly 9,500 um, lost lives. So very, very significant. You, these, these numbers are just, you, you can't even imagine them. In terms of what's happening in Los Angeles County, just bringing it to, to our local environment, the, the graph you see at the very top is the, the number of hospitalizations, the number of people in Los Angeles County hospitals, and what you see on this curve are three bumps. These were the three waves. Uh, the first wave was back in March and April. The second one was uh, in the summertime. And the third wave is what you see today. And that curve is quite steep. What you also see at the bottom are also some recent data from the county that looks at the percentage of people that are testing positive. That's the bottom graph on the left. The bottom middle graph reports the number of daily deaths um, from COVID-19 in Los Angeles County. And um, the, the graph on the bottom right represents the daily number of hospitalized patients. So as you see, the curves are all headed north everything is going in the wrong direction. Um, at Cedar sinai we monitor the data ourselves. This is some of our local data in the emergency department. As you see, the graphs are fairly similar from our emergency department compared to what you saw in the county. In March, we had a, a spike in July. We had a, a smaller wave. And now in December, it's way up in terms of the number of patients that come to the hospital to be evaluated roughly 50% of the patients currently are requiring hospitalization. And this is some of the data that we have at the medical center. As you see, the spikes are similarly super high. We have over 300 cases uh, of uh, COVID-19 patients at Cedar sinai That's over a third of our capacity. So who gets hospitalized? It's a question that comes up fairly often. When should you go to the hospital? Well, we try to reserve hospital resources for those who need the most. And criteria for hospitalization are people who, having, who have respiratory distress or failure, which basically means people are having a hard time breathing. There are a subset of patients who may not be breathing very fast or labored, but their oxygen levels are low. And there are these portable devices that are readily available. Uh, lots of you, I'm sure, have them and have seen them. If that number, goes below 93 steadily, that's a trigger that we may be heading towards um, a situation where the lungs are beginning to fail as a consequence of COVID-19 and we require inpatient treatments. 
And of course, COVID-19, although it's primarily a respiratory illness, it also causes other issues. There are certain patients who have kidney failure. There are certain patients who have changes with their thinking. They become confused, disoriented, comatose. These are some of the older patients that we see with frailty who reside in the nursing facilities. Some patients develop electrolyte disturbance. Some have a lot of gastrointestinal side effects and become dehydrated and they require treatment. And there are others who develop heart and brain complications. Some patients develop heart attacks. Many patients, their heart begins to fail in a condition called congestive heart failure, and many suffer stroke. And those are conditions that obviously require inpatient stay. So what do we do in the hospital? What do we do in the hospital? Well, our primary medical treatments um, are described here. There are some medications that we use, but what's not listed here is the primarily supportive treatment, which is oxygen. We do a number of therapeutics with oxygen through nasal cannulas, face masks, and sometimes if patients are sick enough, they require ventilatory support, we place you on a ventilator. In terms of medications, some of the medications became available to us through uh, randomized clinical trials. One of the common ones that you may hear about is a medication called remdesivir. This is an intravenous infusion that's provided in the hospital. And although this drug has not been proven to affect mortality, it has been shown to reduce the number of days that people are sick. So in this large trial of some thousand patients, um, the median recovery time was, was 10 days compared to those who didn't get this therapy, which was 15 days. So this is something that we provide in the hospital to, to reduce how sick you are and the duration of illness. This other data that you see, this comes from a, a famous trial now called the recovery trial. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in July. And this was uh, an excellent study that looked at the use of a form of steroid called dexamethasone in patients with COVID-19. And this is the, the one and only drug that we have studied in a hospital setting, which actually reduces mortality. And so this is another medication that if you are sick and you require hospitalization, especially if you have pulmonary complications, this is provided to you. And the way the study worked was they studied some uh, over 6,000 patients, over 2,100 received dexamethasone. And in the patients who received dexamethasone, their outcome was much better in terms of their mortality rate. The mortality rate was lower. And interestingly enough, for reasons that are not 100% clear to us, this dexamethasone, the steroid, only showed its effectiveness in people that actually had severe disease, patients who had severe lung disease to the point that they required supplemental oxygen or some form of ventilatory support. In fact, in the group of patients who were in the hospital, but they didn't require oxygen and they didn't require ventilatory support, when they received this dexamethasone, they actually did worse they actually did worse, which is why it is not standard of care to provide steroids for patients with COVID-19 if they're not sick enough to be in the hospital. Other things we do in the hospital medications wise is we thin your blood. We use anticoagulants, powerful medications, because one of the effects of this, uh, this virus is to thicken the blood. And as the blood thickens, patients can have problems. They can develop stroke, heart attack, they can develop blockages of arteries to their limbs and their organs. And we've learned that if we thin the blood, patients do much better. You've also probably heard of monoclonal antibodies. We, as we studied and studied different things that we could do to help patients, we discovered that there are antibodies that could be produced um, in the, in, in, the, in the laboratory, Eli Lilly Drug Company developed one of these first antibodies. And actually one of our uh, uh, physicians, Dr. Chen was the lead scientist and many of the patients were recruited here at Cedar sinai What we discovered was that if, if we take a patient who has mild disease, 
And we know that patients start with mild disease and a small percentage go on to develop severe disease. We learned that if we give these patients at the early stages of illness, this infusion of this monoclonal antibody, this antibody that blocks and neutralizes the virus, the patients tend to do better. So in this first study that was published in the New England Journal, the treatment group had a much lower rate of requiring repeat visits to the emergency room or to be hospitalized when they received the monoclonal antibody compared to the placebo group who did not. Regeneron, which you may have heard of, which was the monoclonal cocktail. It's, a, it's, a, it's two recombinant antibodies combined together that was provided to the president when he became ill. This pretty much is the same type of a, uh, of a, of a therapy. In this cocktail, these two monoclonal antibodies that were developed by the drug company, when given to patients early, um, within 72 hours of testing positive for COVID-19, the rate of them coming back to the ER or requiring hospitalization was much lower, 3% compared to 9%. And so there, you ask, why can't we give it to everybody? Why don't we give it? Do we give it? Well, it turns out that unfortunately, the amount of monoclonal antibody that's available through these drug companies is very limited. And the, the process by which these are provided is through an infusion. And so the environments by which you can set up chairs for highly infected patients with COVID and give them an IV and give them an infusion, a three hour process are quite limited. And we're working on expanding them. The indications, are listed here. And for the most part, we're providing this monoclonal antibody therapy to people who are considered high risk. And this data comes from the CDC based on what the experience has been to date, which is that patients that are high risk are patients that have a high body mass index. Those are patients that are larger, patients that have chronic kidney disease, diabetics, patients that have immunocompromising conditions, like if they have cancer, if they're on chemotherapy, um, patients that are older, age by itself, as we know, is a major risk factor for COVID-19. As we get older, our body becomes more and more at risk for developing severe disease. And there's also cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease also qualifies. So there's different environments um, and there are different hospitals have set up different ways of prioritizing. We have a process at Cedars where we prioritize and we try to give this therapy to the patients that are at the highest risk of doing poorly. And some of you may have had your physicians refer you for this therapy. We come to the vaccine. This is what we've been looking forward to. The best way to prevent viruses from, from infecting us and making us ill is through vaccines. And the first vaccines came on the scene um, on December 10th, we had this New England Journal of Medicine publication looking at the first vaccine that was developed by Pfizer. This was an incredible achievement from the standpoint of science. It was absolutely incredible. They enrolled 43,000 patients. They did a multinational study so that you, 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 were able to eliminate any biases based on any one race versus the other that may impact the efficacy of the virus. They looked at patients that were 16 years or older and they randomized. They gave half the patients vaccine and they get half the patients placebo. And they monitored these patients for the next two months on average. And they looked to see what rates of the two different cohorts developed COVID-19 in their natural um, uh, activities. And interestingly enough, during this time period, the prevalence of COVID-19 was not as high, certainly not as high as today. And this study, and this detail becomes important because they studied a lot of different people. Some 83% were white, but there was a significant inclusion of Blacks and African-American, Asians, a small proportion of Native Americans. They did it in multiple countries, Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, and of course the United States 
uh, provided the largest population. And so of the roughly 37,000, 18,000 of the patients received the vaccine and 18,000 received placebo. They also included patients that were older, more than 55 years of age. There was a significant proportion that were over six, um, 65 years of age. And how did it do? Well, this is the data that you hear about on the news in terms of how effective it is. When they look to see how protective people were after receiving the vaccine, they only had time to follow patients for roughly two months. They noticed that the group that received the vaccine was 95% less likely to develop or to develop COVID-19. And this 95% efficacy seemed to apply to patients both 16 all the way to 64, and even patients that were older. This is quite the achievement, 95%. We don't have many vaccines that perform like this. What about side effects? Um, well, before we get to side effects, let's talk about Moderna. Moderna was the other vaccine, same technology. These are both mRNA vaccines, which is a brand new technology in, in terms of vaccine uh, development, which is outside the scope of this talk, but scientifically speaking, absolutely enthralling. In the Moderna study, they enrolled 30,000. These numbers are huge. So some 40,000 in Pfizer, some 30,000 Moderna, and some 15,000, basically half received the vaccine. And in the Moderna study, similar methodology, they had 94% effectiveness and no cases of severe disease. So even when people, the small number of people, the four, excuse me, the five or 6% who got ill, and they didn't end up requiring hospitalization. And this is some of the data in terms of the primary efficacy analysis of that, of that group. And the Moderna vaccine, similarly speaking, it seemed to be protective in both patients, adults up to age 65, and in the geriatric population as well. In the 18 to 65 age group, the efficacy was 95.6%. The, the, for patients over 65, it dropped just a little bit to 86%. But still, these numbers are amazing from a scientific standpoint. So people ask, safety, safety, safety. Is it safe? Well, both trials did an amazing job of monitoring vaccine side effects. As a matter of fact, they prospectively asked questionnaires from everybody in terms of what kind of side effects would they get? And these are the, um, what is considered mild side effects. So if you get a shot in your arm, it's gonna hurt. That's not a surprise. Um, just like many vaccines, a significant uh, proportion of patients, usually by the time the second vaccine rolls around, had some fatigue, had headaches, some muscle aches and chills, some joint pain, fever. These are things that we're not surprised with because in order for a vaccine to work, it needs to elicit an immune response. And when your immune system is active, you have the same symptoms as many of us traditionally think of as having a flu. Because when you have the flu, your body's reacting to the flu to get rid of it. And so these are similar symptoms as you might expect. But what's very interesting is that when it came to the serious side effects, very, very few, less than 1%. There's a few cases of hypersensitivity reactions these are reactions where people get some hives, some redness. There were some uh, uh, adverse um, re events reported around the vaccine being administered to the shoulder. One patient had an injury there. These numbers were tiny. And similar with the Moderna vaccine, there was a lot of hype around uh, one uh, side effect called Bell's palsy. That's a condition where the nerve that moves the side of the face can get temporarily paralyzed and dysfunctional. There were three cases of Bell's palsy in the patients who received the Moderna vaccine compared to one who was in the placebo group. And really with those numbers, three versus one, it's hard to say whether that has any statistical significance or whether it was purely luck. There was two cases of facial swelling 
Interestingly, in people who had in injections with dermalogic fillers, we're not sure what that is, but it was, it was not a, a, a very uh, concerning issue. And one patient who had intractable nausea and vomiting, who had continuous nausea and vomiting after they received the vaccine. But interestingly, the same patient had a prior history of headache and nausea requiring hospitalization in the past. So overall, the data suggests both vaccines that are currently available to us are extremely safe. So how's the vaccine coming to us? The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices provided recommendation to the CDC. And what's going to be happening, as you've heard, is uh, the vaccine is going to become available in phases. The first phase, phase 1A, which already got implemented in Cedar sinai started this uh, two weeks ago now, was to start immunizing healthcare personnel. In phase one, there's also long-term long uh, care facility residents. And the reason for that, as you might guess, the patients in long-term care facilities tend to be older, they tend to have underlying medical conditions. And even though they represent a minority of the total number of COVID cases, they represent some 40% of those who die. So these are the patients that we need to vaccinate quickly. And there's work being done to get the vaccines to the nursing homes and the other long-term care facilities to make that work. Once phase 1A is done, we move to phase 1B, which is the essential workers, and then phase 1C, which are adults with high-risk medical conditions. And after 1C, it opens up to the general public. And as you might guess, in terms of the phases that we're going through right now, healthcare personnel, there's some 21 million. That's a lot of people that we need to vaccinate, long-term uh, care facility residents. That's about 3 million. So right now, a tremendous amount of work is being done through the, um, the US government, the state, local authorities to get the vaccines out um, to the right uh, environments so they could be administered as soon as possible. So this, this past week was an exciting week, very exciting week. And I look forward to QA on this, which was, there was a study that came out that um, was, was, was gave us a little bit more hope around immunity after COVID-19 infection itself. Before the study was available, we, we thought that after you had COVID-19, as long as obviously you did well and you recovered, that immunity may last up to three months. And some of our guidelines said, well, up to three months, you're probably okay. We don't need to even retest you. This new study that was published on the 23rd within the past week in the New England Journal of Medicine out of uh, researchers in the United Kingdom actually demonstrated that immunity after usual COVID-19 infection is actually closer to six months. So that's actually quite reassuring. And that might mean that perhaps people that have had COVID-19 may not even benefit or need the vaccine. And, and if they're not in the high-risk groups, maybe we can defer them. I don't know, this is brand new. And so the guidelines I'm sure will be updated. And lastly, what about this new strain? Everyone's talking about it. Is it is it surprising? Well, let's 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 go through it. It 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 became known to us back in November. This was a variant strain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and as of now, it's become the prevalent strain in the southeast portion of England. So right now, 60% of recent infections in London are because of this new strain. The strain is basically the same virus, but it has a mutation at a site where the virus binds. The spike protein is the protein that's on the surface. That's that sort of uh, on, the, on the schemes that you see of this virus. That's the head of the flower. And that's the piece that binds the receptors on cells of humans, and it enters the cell and causes infection through replication. In December, interestingly, South Africa announced that it also had a different strain. Similar uh, new strain, it also had a variant uh, at the same mutation, but it seemed to be very different. So what's happening? 
Why are these strains coming up? Is it a surprise? And the answer is no. We know that viruses mutate all the time. As a matter of fact, some estimates are that viruses mutate every two to four weeks. And just like all RNA viruses, the coronavirus has been mutating and will continue to mutate. Um, other viruses do the same thing. Influenza, for example, mutates every year. It turns out that uh, fortunately for now, we don't believe that this new strain, uh, although it may be more contagious, we don't believe that it's necessarily more virulent. By that we mean it, we don't think it's more deadly or, or that it causes a higher prevalence of severe disease. And as of now, um, it, the, the, the information and the science is proceeding, but as of now, we have, a pretty good hunch that the current vaccines are going to continue to be effective against it. So that's so far very good news. What this means though is that we're gonna to need to continue developing more vaccines and staying on top of mutations that may come up over the, over the years. So the timeline, the, the light at the end of the tunnel that we're looking for, um, if all goes well, um, general public, we hope, will have access to the vaccine sometime in March and April. According to uh, Dr. Fauci, we hope to have some 70 to 85% of the population vaccinated by the mid to end of summer. And if all goes well, we'll see the end of the tunnel sometime in the summer of 2021. With that, I'll stop and see and start our QA. Actually, we'll start. Uh, the rabbi section and then go to QA. You're on mute. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tabati, for that excellent presentation. Um, it's, uh, you gave us some really uh, important, up-to-date latest information that covered a lot of different a lot of different details and it's very reassuring to hear about the incredible achievement and the efficacy of the vaccines. So, um, hold on one second. So before we address questions, I wanted to share a few halachic perspectives, some of which is based on the guidance of my teacher, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, uh, some of which is kind of basic, but I think it's necessary to be, to be stated in the context of this uh, conversation. Uh, we all know that halacha obligates us to safeguard our health and safeguard the health of others. Uh, that's the whole premise of this discussion. The Pasuk in Devarim, in Parshat Bet Hanan says, guard your souls carefully. And the sages derive from here that we must take any action necessary to prevent illness or harm. Now to determine what protects our health, the halacha is clear that we respect science and the expert opinion of doctors, which is why I was listening closely and why you were listening closely to Dr. Tabati's presentation on all the different facets of the virus and the vaccine. And rabbis have to know what their field of expertise is and what it isn't. And so for those fields that we as rabbis do not know about, so then we have a responsibility to listen to the experts. Nine months ago, when the pandemic struck the United States, we followed medical advice to think the painful step of closing our shul, closing Beth Jacob, really before we were obligated to do so by the county. And now to emerge from the pandemic, we need to once again follow expert medical opinion. And so that's, that's what halacha says. Halacha says that you, got, you have to safeguard your health. And the way to do that is, you're not gonna really find that in the Shulchan Aruch, you're not gonna find that in the Rambam, uh, the way you're going to find that is, although the Rambam was a, was a respected doctor himself, what I mean to say is that halacha says that the way to fulfill this mitzvah is by listening to the doctors. And if the consensus of the medical experts is that the vaccine is safe, effective, and the benefits out, outweigh the, the risks, then it is my view, and I think it's a view of all rabbis, that we really need to follow that determination. Uh, one interesting source I came across recently is from Rabbi Yisrael Lipschitz, who's from the first half of the 19th century. In his classic commentary of the Teferit Yisrael on the Mishnah, he talks about inoculation from pakin, which is smallpox. 
and first he praises Dr. Edward Jenner as a, as a righteous Gentile who developed the smallpox vaccine around the turn of the millennium in 1800. And Rabbi Yisrael Lipschitz demonstrates that even if there's a risk to take a medicine or vaccine, even if there may be some side effects that Dr. Tarbati outlined, and you may still have some questions about it, and that's something that's a concern. Uh, whenever there's a new vaccine or a new medicine, certainly one with new technology, it's reasonable to have the concern, but you have to seek out the medical research, um, find out the accurate information. And even if there is a risk, the Teferis Israel says, to taking a medicine or a vaccine, it's permitted to take it if it's gonna protect you from a greater danger. And the greater danger, the doctors tell us, is contracting uh, COVID itself than any of these relatively minimal side effects. And so that's an important source from the Tzfaris Yisrael is that it's permitted to, uh, to proactively put yourself at a minimal risk to save yourself, protect yourself from a greater risk. And so based on everything that uh, that Dr. Tabati that you've shared with us, and I look forward to hearing from Dr. Zabner, with whom I've had conversations about this already. You know, I, I, my personal view is that this next vaccine is a miracle. It's a nace. And you spoke about the incredible achievement. And at Beth Jacob, while taking safety measures, we've never forgotten the role of God, which is why we've been praying to him to bring an end to this pandemic. And at this time, I believe it's important for us to express gratitude to God to Hashem that he gave the doctors the wisdom to figure this out. Hashem runs the world and asks us to take the initiative to make it happen with his assistance. One other interesting thing that I wanna share with everyone is that there's, a, that there's actually a prayer that you can and perhaps should say. Uh, there's one prayer that's found in the Shulchan Aruch upon taking any medicine or going in for a surgery where you say that this, she'asek zeli l'rafua, that this um, medicine or this treatment should be effective and it should help me get better. But also I heard from Rabbi Herschel Schechter that the blessing that you say after getting the vaccine is Baruch HaTashem Elokeinu Melech Olam HaTov Vahametiv. God is good and does good to others. And I think this bracha really encapsulates the dual purpose of taking the vaccine. Because when you have something that's a, a, a wonderful development for you personally, you say Shechianu. But if it's a wonderful development for you and for others, then you say the blessing, Hatov Hametiv, God is good and does good for others. And so I think that's really kind of captures why it's important to take this vaccine because it's good for your health and it's good for others' health to develop this herd immunity to get us through this pandemic. But that's also halachically speaking, a blessing that you say after, after you get the vaccine. So. I have a couple other thoughts, but I'm going I'm to end my, end my comments pretty much for now because I want to hand it over to Dr. Zabner and Dr. Trabati to address questions. But I will just end with the following, which is that, you know, speak to your physician, speak to your healthcare provider. If you're not one of the exceptional cases and if you're eligible to take the vaccine, I urge you, strongly recommend you take the vaccine when it becomes available, but listen to the medical experts. Listen to what they're saying. Rabbi Willig, Rabbi Mordechai Willig feels that it's an obligation to take it. Others have formulated it as more of like a strong recommendation. Either way, uh, it's, it's important to take it. And I saw, and I'll end with a, a, a picture of Chief Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, who is a visitor of, at Beth Jacob. He was, he's former Chief Rabbi of Israel. Now he's Chief Rabbi of Tel Aviv. And he's a child survivor of Buchenwald. And, and he's someone who obviously is an iconic figure of Am Yisrael, represents um, the story of the Jewish people withstanding and overcoming so many challenges. And it was a picture of him taking the vaccine. And what he said was, he said that you must not be afraid. You must not be afraid, Rabbi Lau tells all of us, vaccination is an obligation for all of us. So those are just a few perspectives from Jewish law and Jewish thought. And I wanna now hand it over to Dr. Tabati, back to, back to Dr. Tabati and also to Dr. Zabner. Certainly Dr. Zabner, you could add any remarks, but also to get to, get to questions. I think questions are coming into me. They might be also coming into 
uh, Dr. Turbati and Dr. Zabner, but maybe I'll, I'll get us started. Uh, Dr. Zabner, do you want me to go right into questions or did you want to add anything yes. before I ask questions? Please, after your, um, uh, what you said, there's nothing else I can say about um, getting the vaccine. So we're ready for the questions. Okay. Um, and in terms of, well, I'll just ask you to start, uh, Dr. Zabner, in your view, is the vaccine, is it, is it safe? Is it effective? Would you say the benefits outweigh the risks? Can you give us a quick recommendation on that basic point? There is no doubt that based on all the results of the last, the two vaccines that are going to be, are available now, that the risks are low and the benefits are very high. It's a very efficacious vaccine. And based on my own experience, when I participated in the Pfizer trial and I received the vaccine, um, the list of uh, side effects that Dr. Torbadi put in that list were, um, I felt it, I felt the pain in the arm. I was a bit tired the next day, I had to take a nap. But um, in my personal experience, taking Tylenol or Motrin the day after the vaccine helped a lot. Okay, uh, one, one question, thank you so much, Dr. Zabner. Uh, one question that has come to me in the, in the chat is that being the fact that this process was so quick, there's a concern of some that maybe there were that that there were you know there was a cutting of some corners that maybe there were steps that were skipped that maybe there's some safety concerns with the vaccine what do uh, this is to both the Dr. Zabner and Dr. Tabati what do you say about that about that concern um, and you know the fact that it did happen so quickly which was remarkable but does that mean that there were maybe some steps that were skipped in terms of the safety of the vaccines I think Dr. Torbadi showed very nicely how it was published. It was done scientifically. Number one, the technology for this vaccine is new, but was already ready to go. So it's new for us, but they were already working for this type of vaccine for the prior uh, SARS, which is a very similar coronavirus as we have now. So they already knew how to prepare this. So that was already a baseline that in, in few months, we're ready, we're ready to go. The second part is that the vaccine was um, promoted. It was a big interest to make the vaccine. So very rarely the whole world says, we want to help to make this vaccine. So they are sponsoring not only the Pfizer trial in the Moderna, other at least another 20 vaccines that will be available soon. So that also helped for it to, looks like it's fast, but all of a sudden they collected all these people to donate the money, to do the research. And the third part is that when they plan these vaccines, they need a lot of volunteers to prove that the vaccine works or doesn't work. And that was the third part that all of us volunteer and like Dr. Torvani mentioned, it's remarkable how many people around the world volunteered for this vaccine. So to answer the question, was not, it was done fast, but it was done very careful and very uh, scientifically. And there's no doubt that the, everybody was paying attention and they were not cut corners on this. Yeah, to, to add to that, um, again, you know, from the scientific uh, standpoint, the scientific community was kind of doing its own scientific methodology around all of this while the drama and the politics was playing out. That was a nice uh, distraction. But really, at the end of the day, when we look at the methodology that was used to develop this vaccine, both vaccines that we have available under emergency use authorization, they followed the exact blueprint of what you would want. There was phase one trials, phase two. The, the, the last uh, numbers that I showed you were numbers from the phase three trials, which were um, performed for safety and efficacy. There was no shortcuts taken. Uh, I know that there was a lot of push you know, from the administration to get it out. But from the standpoint of science, everything sort of came together, as Dr. Zamner mentioned. 
there was a tremendous interest from the world to develop this. There was tremendous support from the um, federal government in terms of guaranteeing against losses for the company. There was an incredible support from um, patients that were willing to accept the vaccine and be a part of it. I don't think we're gonna ever see this sort of thing again. And again, just to put it into perspective, for a vaccine trial to get three or 4,000 patients is incredibly unheard of. That, those are the numbers that we use when we come up with new vaccines. To get tenfold amount for two vaccines that use similar technology and to have both have the same type of incredible outcome, that, that's as solid a science as we can get. And what's more important is that, interestingly enough, the science goes on. As these vaccines are implemented, the safety profiles will continue to be monitored. There are uh, processes in place where patients have the ability to report side effects, hospitals, healthcare uh, providers will continue to monitor. And as the numbers go from the 30 or 40,000 to 300 to 400,000, we're gonna have tenfold amount of information in a very short period of time on the safety and efficacy. And that's really what's gonna to continue to, to prove to us that these vaccines are both effective, efficacious, and safe. Okay, thank you both. A couple of other questions. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, but let's, so uh, we'll see if we can solve that. Uh, one question is, is there any preference of Moderna over Pfizer or the other way around? Or is it uh, kind of in whatever you get is fine? Another question is, there's a concern that's been raised based on some reports about it causing infertility in women. Is there any legitimacy uh, to those reports uh, or, you know, and the third is another question, what happens if you have the antibodies and don't know it and then take the vaccine? Is that a problem? I, I just asked three, just three questions. There's a lot of questions coming in. I figured I would ask three at one time. Moderna, well, okay. women's infertility. And number three, what if you have the antibodies already? So I can answer the difference between the Moderna and the Pfizer is the same type of vaccine where there is a piece of, um, it's called RNA, messenger RNA that enters the body into the cell and produces in a factory what everybody calls the spike protein. The difference between the two vaccines is how this piece of RNA is packaged and it's packaged in a little envelope of uh, a fat. One of them, the fat has to be under minus 70 well heard in freezers. And the other one, they had the technology where it doesn't need to be frozen at such a low temperature. The second question about the fertility, once this piece of RNA enters the cell, it dissolves, it disappears, produces, makes its job, produces this uh, spike protein and is no longer there. It doesn't get into your nucleus. It doesn't get into your genes. It doesn't pass on to your families. So it basically makes the job and disappears. Yeah, the, um, uh, in terms of who gets which vaccine, interestingly, um, it's really going to be a function of um, how to actually deliver the vaccine to that environment. As, as Dr. Zabner mentioned, the cold chain issues of the Pfizer vaccine are significant. Um, to have a vaccine at negative 70 degrees for, you know, in order for it to maintain its uh, stability and then later have a set period of time until you can thaw it and deliver it, that operationally is challenging. And um, that's something that, for example, hospitals can do, you know, big, large hospitals with large freezers like Cedar sinai But for other environments um, that don't have access to, to such negative temperatures, the Moderna vaccine is gonna be just functionally easier to do. 
And clearly you can't bring nursing home patients to the hospital. It's easier to take the, the vaccine that actually fits them. So as you can imagine, what will probably happen is that the Moderna vaccine will be provided to the long-term care uh, facilities because it's easier to get it there before it, it generates. And the, um, and the Pfizer will be provided in hospital settings. And the objective is really to get as much vaccine out to as many people as fast as possible. There was a third question that I think we missed. Infertility. So the, um, one of the issues with vaccine development in both of the trials was that a number of patients were excluded. And again, this is part of the scientific process when it comes to developing any drug they're not given to, to pregnant women. They're not given to lactating women. Um, they're not given to uh, children. They're first given to patients who we don't anticipate having significant side effects. And then they're, they go back and now they, they extend it and, and they study in the other populations. Another population, for example, that was excluded from both trials was patients that, had, that were immune compromised. So we don't have any direct evidence to either for or against it, but as Dr. Zabner says, the way these are set up, the way these vaccines are signed, you know, the, the way they work, uh, just uh, we, can't, uh, we can't really put two and two together. The biology would not make sense. Okay, the biology would not make sense that something like that would happen. Let me, let me raise another question in terms of it's possible that this was addressed at some point, and, but how long does the vaccine last for? Will we have to take it again after the initial two doses? In other words, is it every six months, every year? Is there a possibility that it'll last much longer? I can answer the how long it's going to last. So there are studies now showing that the vaccine induces uh, memory immunity. So potentially, based on what they're finding uh, on those memory immunity can last for years. We'll only know once time passes, but potentially it could be a long lasting vaccine. Great. Yeah, the, the trials, because the, the trials measured um, basically the rates of infection at two months. That's what science can only speak to what the science measured. So at the time of the publications, there was enough time to monitor patients out to two months. However, as time goes on, we'll have more information. And we also have data from, you know, we've been scientifically studying viruses and vaccines for a very long time. So the projections are very positive, as Dr. Zavra mentioned, that the vaccine is going to have significant prolonged um, protective effects, both through um, developing antibodies and also by priming our T cells, which are the cells that remember uh, a particular pathogen and react to it when it comes through again. But what we don't know is what's the impact of these viruses if they mutate. So if in six months or a year, we have a significant mutation where a particular virus strain no longer um, has the same response to a vaccine, that's when the vaccination process may begin. And there, there are those who believe that what will probably happen with this is we'll go through a process of getting this disease under control and that this virus may turn into another seasonal virus, very similar to influenza, and that every year, perhaps we may need, every year, every six months, we may need boosters to protect us. The science is too early to know. Unlike the flu, which we've been studying for decades, we've only been studying this virus for less than a year. And what happens, uh, what happens if you have the antibodies and you don't know it and have the vaccine? Is there any concern there? The, the studies actually included patients um, uh, that it had um, uh, COVID-19 in the past. 
So um, as far as we know, there is no, there's absolutely no harm. And current guidance from the CDC is that you may certainly receive it. However, as we're getting more information about um, some of the immunity that comes with previous infection, some of the guidance may change to perhaps defer some of those patients because right now we have more people that should get it and need it than we have vaccine available. So there's certainly no harm, um, but it would be okay also to defer for the sake of others, which may bring up an interesting halacha question for you, Rabbi. If you've had the virus in the last month and you're offered the vaccine, should you take it or should you defer it to somebody else? Right, that is, that is, that is an excellent halacha question. And I think that, that speaks to the issue in terms of, you know, I think it's important that a person does not, well, that, that, that's an element of the question. A related point is that a person, I think, should not cut the line. I think inherently it's the wrong thing to do. And also it's a chil Hashem, it's a desecration of God's name. And there's a very, very bad story that's developing in New York that some of you might have already read. So that, that question you just asked, uh, Dr. Sam, is a very, very good one in terms of uh, being very sensitive to prioritization about who should get the vaccine first. And if indeed a person has the antibodies because they had it recently, then I think that would be a, um, you know, a, a, um, a meritorious thing to do, maybe the right thing to do to let somebody else get it first. If indeed um, the, the, medical, the medical opinion is that since you've, you've had it already, then you're protected at least for a period of time. It'd be good to let somebody else get the vaccine and then for you to defer yourself to get it a couple months from now. I think it's very, very important not to cut the line. It's the wrong thing to do and it certainly obviously causes what we call a chil Hashem. Dr. Zabner, did you want to add something? Um, no, I agree that the immunity that the disease may infer may last longer than we think and will change. And we have to remember that sometimes we say one thing and a few months later we change it because we're learning together how this disease is evolving. So many times we also have to go and say, I know I told you this six months ago and now we learn more and then we're changing this. So probably will be the same thing with the findings we're having with the antibody response and how the vaccine induces that, uh, what Dr. Torvadi mentioned, the T cell immunity. If you remember that you had the infection, even though we don't find the antibodies, when you're exposed again, that memory says, oh, here's the virus again. Let me produce the soldiers to fight it. So I always say, the memory cells are the Pentagon and the antibodies are, is the Navy and the army. And they go in, the war is over, they retreat. And then the Pentagon says, oh, there's a war again, go, go, go. And that's how it works. And the vaccine will do that for sure. And the disease may do it too. Okay, um, thank you. Are there any other are there any other, there's, there's a number of other questions that have come in to me, but I think a lot of them have already been addressed. Uh, Dr. Tabati, Dr. Zabner, have you received any questions in the chat that you want to specifically uh, speak to? I'm not able to see any. Okay. There may be some, I'm just not able to see any. Dr. Zabner, do you see any? Oh, there's a question I see um, about uh, vaccination priority for patients over 90 um, who have 24-hour care at home but are not in long-term facilities. Um, that's a very, very good question. I think there's going to be questions like that that come up. And already the um, ACIP has adjusted a little bit of its uh, staging um, and it's possible that uh, patients who are older and receive care at home, 24-hour care, may 
be considered similar to those at long-term care facilities because they have the same, uh, the same issues. Um, we don't have specific data on patients over 90. Um, we, there was, there was a, some patients that were over 65. I don't think we have a, you know, the same thousands of patients over 90 yet. Um, but I think that data will, will come forward as, as we get more, more data. I wanted to add something. I don't know if it's on the, vac on the questions, but it hasn't been mentioned that once you get the vaccine, the first shot will only start working after 10 days to two weeks. And it's very, very important that we all continue to use the distancing and the face mask and the not gathering in large groups and don't feel that now you're safe because you received the vaccine. Uh, we also are not 100% sure that even when the vaccine protects you, when you're exposed to the virus, you may carry that virus in your nose, on your system, even though you're not sick and you may expose somebody else to the virus. So still use all the um, protection that we all know about how to protect from COVID. Yeah, I see a, a similar question um, asking, how long after the population is vaccinated will people still be advised to use PPE? And, and I don't think we have that number yet. Uh, again, the vaccine is not 100%. And the study asked the question of whether the vaccine protects you from getting symptomatic COVID-19. It didn't ask whether it prevents you from being a carrier, for example. So we just don't know. So the reality is that certainly in hospital settings, we will continue to have the same uh, PPE policies. And certainly until we have herd immunity and we see drastic reduction of the prevalence of disease, that some of the same guidance around masks and distancing and hand washing will probably remain in place. Saying, you're saying for, for quite some time, uh, even as people are getting the vaccines, because they, they might be, you know, they might still be carriers and also many people will still have not gotten the vaccine, that it, it seems like for quite some time we're still going to be asking people to wear masks and washing their hands and being vigilant about, um, you know, about distancing as well. I, I think, other, yeah, go ahead, Sam. I think we need to be prepared for a future that looks very different than our past. Really, even uh, e even even a year from now, two years from now, can you speak to that a little bit more? Well, you know, I the, the world continues to change, um, and now we have a, a biological you know entity that's changing the world around us. So um, I think we can we can make the world safe again. Uh, over time, I think we can um, bring life closer to what it was before. Um, but our world may look different, just like our world, did, you know, five years ago looked much different than a hundred years ago. So um, we, we may need to prepare for that. That um, some things we may need to take more seriously, you know, hand washing. Um, in the past, we used to take cold and flu not very seriously. And medically speaking, that was a catastrophe because every year, 40 to 80,000 people would die as a consequence of influenza, which is largely preventable through hand washing and through Vaccine. isolation. So, um, and interestingly, do you know how many people have died of flu this year? I don't know, we could probably count it on two hands because the same measures we're protecting against COVID have eliminated influenza. So our world is gonna look different in the future. What's the, thank you so much for sharing some of those uh, so, sobering thoughts, but important uh, <laughs> things for us to keep in mind. Here's a few other things that have come through. 
One is how does a person find out if they're eligible, if and when they're eligible, how do they sign up? Another thing that has come on the chat box is if someone has multiple comorbidities, including lung disease, um, how safe or efficacious is it? Uh, it's been said in some articles not to take it if someone is on blood thinners. What does that mean if you take a daily baby aspirin? Um, and also another, another question here that came through is, what's the definition and specific difference timeline between traditional procedures versus the current emergency allowance for usage? Is there any distinction there that, uh, that is relevant for us? I can take the last one. Um, so emergency use authorization is a process where um, under a particular setting, the FDA may release a therapy um, under particular guidance. So traditionally EUA was used for therapies uh, that were provided in compassionate use environments. So somebody had a disease that we had no cure for, but there was a chance that something may work. Um, some of those, uh, some of that EUA may have been used to provide that therapy to the bed bedside. In this setting, the EUAs um, make a little bit more sense for some of the therapeutics that made it to the market pretty quickly. The virus, uh, the vaccine EUAs, um, were um, provided to facilitate them becoming readily available. But again, there was no shortcuts taken in terms of the study process of these, of these two drugs. There was as much scientific rigor as you can imagine. And there was as much discussion and conversation and oversight as you can imagine. Okay, yeah, so if uh, Dr. Zabner, you don't wanna add anything there. Uh, one question, when do you estimate that those over 65 will start to get the vaccine? I'm not sure if you can take a guess at that. And another thing is, okay, what's the timeline between the first and second shot? I read that it's either, uh, I think three weeks or four weeks, depending upon, you know, Moderna and Pfizer, right? That you could confirm, confirm that. And how much time does one need for the protection to be effective from the, vac from the vaccine? For the, um, for the Pfizer, the study was designed to be three weeks apart and the CDC guidelines allow for a four day sort of variance. For the Moderna, it's four weeks. And in both, the protection and the uh, efficacy was measured roughly two weeks out after the second dose. Because it takes time. It takes time for your body to develop an immune response, both through the mono, uh, both through antibody response and for those T cells. Okay, Dr. Zabner, did you? Okay, one, one question I got, um, what's the evidence for or against ivermestin? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I will take that question because it's a painful question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so ivermectin, it's a uh, drug that was developed for uh, killing parasites. So the parasites are a different entity than the virus. So COVID-19 is a virus and parasites are um, different living creatures that are usually in the stool and when you go on vacation to exotic places and it affects mainly tropical countries. So some scientists decided to try every single drug that was available that they need approval to make a new drug against the COVID. And apparently somebody put the virus and put ivermectin in it, in what we call in vitro, and maybe kill the virus or the virus die on its own. And since then they decided, oh, maybe it works. So they have, they're doing studies, what we call randomized, 
and still has not proven that it works to prevent or to treat. In countries like Brazil, where there's a lot of parasites, and then you can find ivermectin in the pharmacies, they run out of the ivermectin because everybody was taking it to prevent and to treat. And still is a country that suffered immensely um, disease and death with COVID. Sometimes, uh, what we call fake news, put these results or these statements in, in the media, like the same, like Dr. Torvati showed the New England Journal of Medicine has a very nice logo and all that, that looks like real news. So when you see this advertisement about the drug that works or works more or less, be careful. Um, please double check where the source comes and ask your physician or your care or your healthcare provider, is this something that is legit before you diffuse this um, information. Also, when sometimes they do studies in the general population on a disease that is not fatal like COVID. So thank God it's the majority of people when they get sick and they're young, they don't die. It's very hard to prove if the vaccine worked or not when you're taking, oh, excuse me, the ivermectin work or not because you're taking it and you didn't get it or you didn't die and they say, oh, it worked. You know, all of us took it and we didn't get it. It's very hard to prove. But to answer the question, no, ivermectin doesn't work. What about if someone is taking both Plavix and baby aspirin? Is that a, is that a problem? No, that I know. Okay, Sam, Dr. Tobadi. No, I mean, uh, usually patients that um, are taking aspirin and Plavix tend to be prescribed the combination because they have cardiovascular disease. They may have coronary artery disease, for example. And those patients are at higher risk for complications of COVID-19. Um, and if you if we go back to the slides that I'm happy to forward, they they are sort of higher prioritized in terms of when they're gonna have access to it. But it certainly doesn't, um, it doesn't change whether you should or shouldn't take uh, the vaccine. Medically speaking, pretty much everybody should get the vaccine, uh, except perhaps a tiny population where we just don't know yet. You know, pediatrics, for example, we haven't studied it in kids, so we just can't say. However, as of January, uh, beginning of January, there's a vaccine trial that's gonna open to study it in kids. And we're very cautious on the academic side, not to say something works or doesn't work without having proof. So that's the issue is where's the evidence? We, 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 we just like halacha, we don't just say something we believe. It's not a question of belief. It's a question of scientific evidence. If halacha has a, a background based on rabbinic understanding, then there's a, something for you to stand on. In science, if we have data that supports something, then we can say it works or it doesn't work. And sometimes we don't have the data, in which case we don't know. And we just have to be honest and say, we don't know yet. Got it, thank, thank you. That's a, that's a very honest response, thoughtful response. And But I, I, I think to take, um, you know, that we're medically speaking, you said, almost everyone should be taking the vaccine. I think that's the way you put it. Of course, people should speak to their healthcare provider, but that's as a general comment and a takeaway, which is medically speaking, almost everyone should take the vaccine. And that could be, uh, you're welcome to add a final thought, Dr. Tabati or Dr. Zavner, as we wind down the conversation, we thank you both so much. Uh, you wanna share a final, you know, a final word, a final thought? Dr. Dabadi, I give you the option of making that your final thought, but you, or you want it, you could add something too. So the only thing I would add is, um, you know, a, a lot of people have an interest in getting the vaccine. Um, we've heard of unfortunate development of the black, a black market developing. Um, just be careful um, because, you know, when you get something that's, that, that, that's not coming, you know, in, in the right way, there may be consequences. We, you know, you get a vaccine, you don't know what it is and whether it's effective or not effective. Um, it's a problem. So 
you know, where everyone's excited to get the vaccine. I think everybody should be excited to get the vaccine. Um, the vaccine will, will come around and based on what we're seeing, the, the, uh, the companies are doing a tremendous job of making sure that it becomes vastly available, not just for the United States, but for the world. Um, but I would just invite everybody to, to kind of wait uh, and go through the, the, the process and just, and, and do the, do the right thing. Like you said, don't, don't try to make any, get any shortcuts. We would hate for somebody to get hurt because they took a shortcut. Absolutely. Um, and my final words is that we're blessed that we have a vaccine and um, that it's going to help personally in the community. Uh, also, I wanted to extend that a lot of us work with people that um, need to be vaccinated, but they don't read the news or they um, hear different ideas. Please, uh, after this um, meeting today, explain that it is safe, that we heard this, and be our spokesperson for this vaccine. That way it will help us too. And if you have any news of anything that doesn't look right, please double check it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zabner, Dr. Turbati, for this really enlightening conversation and sharing that, uh, that information and that uh, the knowledge about the vaccine that gives us really uh, the ability to have you know, reassurance and hope that uh, we're gonna be able to get through this and get past this pandemic. Um, I want to uh, give a uh, kudos to both of you who are uh, obviously excellent at what you do. And as proud Jews, you're making a Kiddush Hashem, uh, bringing light, bringing healing, um, you know, contributing to the world around you in such wonderful ways. We thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise together with all of us. And with your permission, Dr. Zabna, Dr. Tabati, we could make this recording available to those people who weren't able to join the call in the, com in the community to kind of raise awareness and get the word out. So with your permission, we could, we could have the recording and make it available. We did record the conversation tonight. Okay, so uh, thank you all. Thank you all so very much. Thank you again, Dr. Zabner, Dr. Tarbati. Um, I wish, uh, obviously, Besurot vote. good news for everyone. Uh, stay well, stay safe. Uh, talk to your doctor, but take the vaccine when you're able, when, it, when it's available for you to take it. And hopefully we should just uh, be able to share happy occasions in the future in good health. Laila Tov, thank you so much. <laughs>